A Connecticut Yankee in King Arthur's Court, Chapter 3, Knights of the Table Round, Part 1. Mainly the round table talk was monologues, narrative accounts of the adventures in which these personages were captured and their friends and backers killed and stripped of their steeds and armor. As a general thing, as far as I could make out, these murderous adventures were not forays undertaken to avenge injuries, nor to settle little disputes or sudden fallings out. No, as a rule, these were simply duels between strangers. Duels between people who had never even been introduced to each other, and between whom existed no cause of offense whatever. Many a time I had seen a couple of boys, strangers, meet by chance and say simultaneously, I can lick you! and go at it out on the spot, but I had always imagined until now that that sort of thing belonged to children only, and was a mind and mark of childhood. But here, these were big boobies sticking to it and taking pride in it clear up into full age and beyond. Yet there was something very engaging about these great simple-headed creatures, or just something attractive and lovable. They did not seem to be brained enough in the entire nursery, so to speak, to bait a fish hook with, but you didn't seem to mind that. After a little, because you soon saw that brains were not needed in a society like that, and indeed would have marred it, hindered it, and spoiled its symmetry, perhaps rendered its existence impossible. And as a fine manliness observed in almost every face, and in some a certain loftiness and sweetness that rebuked your belittling criticisms and stilled them. A most noble benignity and purity reposed in the countenance of him they called Sir Galahad, and likewise in the king's also. And there was majesty and greatness in the great frame and high bearing of Sir Lancelot of the Lake. There was presently an incident which centered the general interest upon this Sir Lancelot. At a sign from a sort of master of ceremonies, six or eight of the prisoners rose and came forward in a body and knelt on the floor and lifted up their heads toward a lady's gallery and begged the grace of a word of the queen. The most conspicuously sighted lady in that uh, flower bed of feminine show and finery inclined her head by way of assent, and then the spokesman of the prisoners delivered himself and his fellows into her hands for free pardon, ransom, captivity, or death, as she in her good pleasure might elect. And this, as he said, he was doing by command of Sir Kay the Essential, whose prisoners they were. He, having vanquished them by his single might and prowess and sturdy combat unticked on the field. Surprise and astonishment flashed from face to face all over the house. The queen's gratified smile faded out at the name of Sir Kay, and she looked disappointed, and the page whispered in my ear with an accent and manner expressive of extravagant derision, Sir Kay, forsooth, oh, call me pet names, dearest, call me Marine. In the ice a thousand years shall the unholy invention of man labor at all to get them bellowed to this majestic lie. Every eye was fastened with severe inquiry upon Sir Kay, but he was equal to the occasion. He got up and played it in his hand like a major, and took every trick. He said he would state the case exactly according to the facts. He would tell a simple, straightforward tale without comment of his own. And then said he, if ye find glory and honor due, ye will give it unto him, who is the mightiest man of his hands that ever bears shield or straight with sword in the ranks of Christian battle, even him that sitteth here, and he pointed to Sir Lancelot. Ah, he fetched them, it was a rattling good stroke. Then he went on and told how Sir Lancelot, seeking adventures, some brief time gone by, killed seven giants at one sweep of his sword, and set a hundred and forty-two captive maidens free, and then went further, still seeking adventures, and found him, Sir Kay, fighting a desperate battle against nine foreign knights, and straight away took the battle solely into his own hands, and conquered the nine. And that night Sir Lancelot rose quietly, and dressed him in Sir Kay's armor, and took Sir Kay's horse, and got him away into distant lands, and vanquished sixteen knights in one pitch battle, and thirty-four in another. And all these, in the former nine, he made to swear that about Whitsuntide they would ride to Arthur's court and yield them to Sir Gwenin Guinevere's hands and captives of Sir Kay the Seneschal, spoil of his knightly prowess. And now here were the these snap dozen, and the rest would be along as soon as they might be healed of their desperate wounds. Well, it was touching to see the queen blush and smile and look embarrassed and happy and fling furtive glances at Sir Lancelot that would have got him shot in Arkansas, to a dead certainty. 
Everybody praised the valor and magnanimity of Sir Lancelot, and as for me, I was perfectly amazed that one man all by himself should have been able to beat down and capture such battalions of practiced fighters. I said as much to Clarence, and this mock and editor had only said, And if the Kay had at the time to get another skin of sour wine into him, you had seen the account doubled. I looked at the boy in sorrow, and as I looked I saw the cloud of a deep, deep despondency settle upon his countenance. I followed the direction of his eye, and saw that a very old and white-bearded man, clothed in a flowering black gown, had risen and was standing at the table upon unsteady legs and feebly swaying his ancient head and surveying the company with his watery and wandering eye. The same suffering look that was on the page's face was observable in all the faces around. A look at dumb creatures who know that they must endure and make no moan. Mary, we shall have it again, sighed the boy. Oh, that same old weary tale that he has told a thousand times in the same words and that he will tell till he dieth every time he hath gotten his battle full and feel his exaggeration meal working. Would God I had died, or I saw this day. Who is it? Merlin, the very liar and magician, magician singe him for the weariness he worketh with his one tail. But the men fear him, for that he hath the storms and the lightnings and all the devils that be in hell at his beck and call. They would have dug out his entrails out these many years ago to get at that tail and squelch it. He tells it always in the third person, making believe he is too modest to glorify himself. Maledictions light upon him. Misfortune be his dull. Good friend, pray they call me for even the song. End of part one.